Okay, good afternoon. I'm starting this session. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. There are another 17 uh, running presentations running at the same time, so I, I appreciate that you're here. Um, I'm Rafael Zardoya from the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Madrid, and I'm going to talk about uh, the genetic basis of con snail venoms. So basically, um, what I want to uh, present in the next 10 minutes or so is a glimpse of what the, we are doing in our lab around the description of the genes that are uh, involved in, the, in encoding uh, venoms in con snails. So first, I will just um, present, since we, there's a broad audience here, I will present the, the con snails. They belong to the family conide. It's a large family with a diverse family with a more than a thousand species. And as you can see, colorful, they, they are, the species are differentiated basically based on, on the phenotype of the morphology of the, of the shell and on the banding and colorful color of the pattern, pattern of, of the shell. Um, but they are mostly most known because they are uh, marine snails that are venomous. They are in all tropical and subtropical reefs, and they produce their own venom. This, this venom is, is we will see next is composed of peptides. And basically, there's no. Okay, they, I have to show it like this with the hand. Uh, basically, they produce in that venom duct the uh, the venom, and then the venom bulb just pull pull the venom through the uh, esophagus and, and load the uh, modified teeth that have a, an arpon shape, and that goes out to the prey. And that's the way they, 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 they uh, prey, basically. I can, see, you can, I can show you here uh, a couple of ways. They, some, they have very different behaviors for preying, not only one, as many people think. And uh, you can see the one is over there, the taser and tether. Uh, behavior where where the they just inject right away straight the uh, the uh, harpoons into the prey, whereas there is another uh, a behavior which is called the net hunting in which they open the siphon a lot and then the the fishes in this case fishes get into the siphon and then they are uh, the venom is is there to to paralyze the the prey. So here I am going to put a little video. I hope it works. Maybe not. No, it's not working. Anyway, so no video. Bad luck. You will not see. Well, I was thinking, well, after lunch, it will be nice to see a, a con snail eating and digesting a fish. <laughs> you miss it. Uh, so one of the things we have in any of these uh, uh, groups, what you have to first do is uh, a phylogeny of the group to, to set the phylogenetic framework and the evolution to do any evolutionary comparison. And we have been working doing phylogenomics of the, of the, not of the thousand species, but as many species as possible. And here you've, you sh I show you a, a phylogeny in which the mo what, in where we have uh, make an ancestral character reconstruction of the diet. And basically what it says the phylogeny is that the ancestral, the ancestor of the, of the, of the um, con snails, of the family, uh, hunt on, on worms. And then there was, you can see there in, in brown, there's one shift to, the, those are also snails, but those are, uh, well, snails, sorry, those are worms, but fireworms. So there's one single uh, um, uh, evolution. Uh, they evolved to prey specific, specific, they specialize in, in, in prey um, uh, worm, uh, worm uh, fireworms. Then you have up in the, in the phylogeny another single transition to uh, specialize in, in, in eating uh, as other snails, other marine snails. And the important thing here, or the interesting thing, is that the evolution, uh, the, uh, the specialization in praying fish has occurred twice within the family, once in the Pacific, Indo-Pacific region and once in the Atlantic region. In any case, that particular note is, as you can see, is very short, and the, the support, the bootstrap and the Aegisian the support is, is high, but not maximal. So uh, that has to be taken with caution. And as you can see in the, in the upper 
left part of the slide, the, uh, each of the uh, specialization, diet specializations comes with a specialization or a, morpho a different morphology in the, in the radular teeth. Another interesting uh, feature that is not well known of, of the, uh, of the uh, cone snails is that not only they use their venom for, for preying, but also for uh, defending against predators. And that is uh, the, the, uh, the, um, when they prepare the, the, venom, the venom for doing one or the other uh, behavior, they do it in different parts of the, of the venom duct. The, the, as you can see there, the, uh, the distal and the proximal regions uh, produce the predation defense evoke venoms. Okay? So there is kind of a regionalization of the, trans of the transcription and, and production of venoms within the venom duct. And uh, basically, here is what the what is the uh, what, what the venom of the is, is made of. It's made of conotoxin, what is called conotoxins, which are little peptides, small peptides, that are synthesized as a precursor. The precursor has a, a signal sequence to move, to make the protein go to the endoplasmic reticulum, a proregion that is is this part of the of the precursor is used for processing the precursor, and then the mature toxin, which is the one that's gonna be functional and it's gonna, it's gonna be the, the real toxic one. So once the, the mature toxin is, is, is released, it gets its import, the important part of, the, of this mature, it's, it's very uh, variable, it has a very fast evolutionary rate, but the important thing is they maintain uh, uh, several systems that uh, they are, uh, with these sulfide bonds, made the secondary structure and the tertiary, tertiary structure of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the toxin, of the conotoxin. And uh, the, this, these conotoxins, uh, as you can see here this, in this part of the slide, they are uh, basically inhibiting ion channels or other channels in the synaptic neuro, neuromuscular uh, uh, junction. So they are very uh, useful for doing many neurobiology um, research. And also, one of these conotoxins has been patented, the prealt, because it's the one that is, is used as like a morphine for ter cancer terminal uh, people and to, to um, yeah, it's a painkiller, basically. And this is the main objective of my research, get 50 rich. But <laughs> while this happens, I have to work with the, I have to still be, be, be pretend to be an evolutionary biologist. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, so here I, I'm gonna show you well, that's what we are doing. One of the things is cataloging all the, doing, by doing the transcriptons of the venom duct, cataloging all the, the composition of these conotoxins in each of the venoms. I, I forgot to mention that, well, I, or I mentioned now that each of the uh, transcriptons of, uh, of one species has around 200, 300 different um, uh, mRNAs calling for, for conotoxins. And as you can see here, uh, these are three individuals from the same species and in common, they only have 25 uh, transcripts. All the others are different. So the, the variability, inter-individual variability is very high. So, it, so you really need to sequence, make many transcriptions of different individuals until you get more or less the idea of how many um, gonotoxins are, are produced by each of the species. Um, well, we have been doing a uh, comparison, we have been, um, uh, producing transcriptons of different species, and for example, there you see that we, and I'm gonna show it later, we are comparing one Heliconus arminius, which is one of the, one Atlantic species uh, feeding on, on, on fishes, comparing it with uh, Pionoconus maus, which is a, a species that feeds on, on fishes, but from the Indo-Pacific region, trying to see whether there is, why, how, how different is that, those two origins of, of fish predation. And in the middle, you can see that we have been doing this cylinder amiralis is one that eats snails, and we have been looking at the predatory versus the fence evoke venoms, all this at the transcriptome level. And here you see another case in the, in the right, which is two sister species, Viroconus severus and Viroconus judeus, that as you can see are completely cryptic. If you see the shell, you cannot distinguish them. The three to the left and the three to the right are different species. They are sister species, but you cannot distinguish them. But when you do the transcriptons, they have very different uh, venom um, composition in the cocktail. Um, so more things that we've been doing. 
We've been, in this case, are, these are different species from uh, single radiation in Cape Verde archipelago. And we have uh, sequenced the transcriptomes of the different species and then tried to do ancestral character reconstruction to see which were the, uh, the, the genes, the conotoxin genes that were, could have been in the ancestor of the radiation. And here I come back to what I was saying about uh, the different origins of the of the fish predation in the Atlantic, in the Pacific and the Atlantic. As you can see here, but well, basically to summarize, when we look at the, at the composition of the venoms of the two species, we, uh, we find that um, the superfamily A, which is a family, and I don't know why in the, in the, in the world of, of conotacins they call it superfamilies, what are families of genes? I don't know why they are superfamilies, but anyway, the family A conotoxins which are important because they are uh, inhibiting the nicotine acetylcholine receptors. Uh, in, in the case of the, um, of the, uh, ke the Keliconus serminus and purpurastens, which are the ones in the Atlantic, they use a different uh, system pattern than, than in the case of all the, the Indo-Pacific in red. So basically it is supporting that the, the, the independent origin of the two uh, venoms. Uh, that are converging in, in preying uh, fishes. Okay, so moving on and, and coming to the answer to the question is all this variability, I, I forgot to mention that although they produce 100 to 200 uh, different transcripts, then there are post translational modifications. At, at the end, you have more than a thousand different uh, peptides in, in, in the venom, in a cocktail, in the venom cocktail. So basically one of the important questions that have been around for a while is whether um, you have few genes in the genome and those genes are then producing different transcript, transcripts and those transcripts then produce with peptides that are post-translationally post modified and then you get all the diversity. Or there are many genes in the, in the genome. This is a, let's say a family rich gene, a gene family rich, and, and, that's the, uh, and, and that can be the, the case. So for doing that, we, we generated the first um, uh, chromosome level genome of a snail. Well, actually, we, we generated it, but we didn't publish it the first. So there was a, another competitor that published one way before us. So I have always to say we, we published the second. But anyway, I can live with that, I think. OK, so we have a, a chromosome level uh, genome of this uh, particular species, this the Mediterranean con snail, and has 35 um, uh, scaffolds, chromosomes. And well, the buscos were not as good as, are not as good as in other, uh, and if, uh, if you are having seen other uh, vertebrate genomes, for example, if, oh, this is, this, are, this is smaller because this is not that easy. The important thing is that the, the size of the, the genome size of, um, of uh, con snail genome is, is 3.6 gigas, so it's exactly as, the, as human, so it's quite a big thing. And it's big because when we compare it to Pomacea canaliculata, which is a, an early divergent lineage within Xenogastropoda, where the con snails are, you f we find that there, is a, there has been a whole genome duplication during the, the lineage, this lineage. So the, that's why the uh, con snails are so, the genome is so big. We have characterized the, uh, the conotoxin genes. We map the transcripts into the, into the uh, chromosomes, and we find that the solution to the, to, or the answer to the question whether there was the, the diversity of conotoxins was already in the genome or not is that it's yes. The, this, this is a, a family rich, a gene family that is rich in, in, in uh, has been du duplicated a lot, and it's, it's all over the, the genome. Uh, well, I don't, since I have the gong is already there. I'm going to move to the next slide in which um, we sequence a second uh, genome. This one is um, the uh, con snail from Canary Islands. And basically, you can see in that comparison that there are 35 scaffolds also, but they, they are all shorter than the ones that we got in for, for ventricosus. The numbers of the busco were higher, but in total, the, the, um, the length is slightly smaller. It's, it's 2.8 gigas. And we can we start finding uh, there's a, in in general there's macrosynteny in the chromosomes, but once in a while we find some cases of of inversions, which could be real or could be some kind of um, 
artifact of the, uh, of the scaffolding. We are still uh, debating that. Basically, we see here that the macrosynteny is, is, is maintained between these species, where, which are uh, relatively distant in the, in the phylogeny. And there are long stretches of synteny in the largest chromosomes. It's finishing now, it has to, okay. And then there are, uh, but the shorter chromosomes are more dynamic in terms of synteny. Here I map, here I, I show the transcriptomes, the, the number of transcripts of the two species compared, and you can see that despite the canariensis has a smaller genome, produces many more um, transcripts than, than ventricosus. We mapped that onto the uh, genome, and we have all this, again, all this uh, map of, of conotoxin genes all, all spread all over the, uh, the chromosomes, and we are start uh, comparing the, uh, the synteny and whether the, you can find gene, all the conotoxin genes and, and analyze whether how, they ha how is the birth and death of the gene families of conotoxins. We, got, we are up to, well, already we have a third genome, so we will be able to polarize whether there are expansions or, or not in, in the, how, to polarize how the, the, the evolution of the gene family of conotoxins work. And with this, I finish just thanking all the people that work, have been working over the years in my lab producing all this data. Thank you. Uh, all right, thanks folks for coming. Uh, I'm John Hughes, I'm a postdoc at UC Riverside working with Polly Campbell. Uh, let's talk about centromere evolution and carrier type diversity. Uh, so what sort of like keeps me up at night and gets me up in the morning is I like thinking about sort of mechanisms that underlie chromosomal rearrangements and particularly like why some lineages like muntjacs have like really diverse carrier types whereas others like pinnipeds have very like conserved carrier types even across long periods of time. And a core component of this variation relates to centromeres, right? So quick refresher, right? Centromeres are extremely repetitive parts of the chromosome. They play a critical role in cellular division by linking pairs of sister chromatids, and they recruit kinetochores to which the spindle attaches. And the function of centromeres is highly conserved, but the repetitive sequences that form them are often highly divergent between species, and this is often referred to as the centromere paradox. So this diversity in sequence is likely a result of conflict manifesting primarily in uh, or through like a process called meiotic drive, where one chromosome biases its own transmission uh, during meiosis, most commonly thought about in terms of the uh, production of oocytes. So if one chromosome can ensure that it ends up in the egg over its counterpart, which goes to the polar body, uh, it benefits. And so you have this sort of conflict between them, right? And this leads to rapid evolution of centromere sequences as they sort of compete to modify their kinetochore recruitment and thus determine their ultimate fate. Um, and what's extremely cool is this sort of process can influence like gross chromosome morphology, where in some species like acrocentric forms are preferentially transmitted and in others metacentrics get preferentially transmitted. And you can imagine that the fission or fusion of chromosomes at the centromere radically alters its structure very quickly. Um, downside, this rapid evolution of centromere repeats makes identifying them really challenging in genomes, right? And, most of the time when folks look at centromeric sequences, it's done either through like micro dissection of centromeres or through like chromatin immunoprecipitation. Um, and you know, we might hope that there are some shared features of centromeres, but often no. Uh, repeat units are super variable in mammals. Uh, GC content varies a lot. Uh, there are sometimes conserved motifs like the SEMP box, but it shows up in some species and not all of them. And where it does show up, its function is not always conserved. Um, and repeats can vary at the centromeres through a number of processes, including sort of expanding and contracting through fusions, changing of the underlying monomer sequence. Um, complicating this, though, is a sort of competing framework termed to the library hypothesis, right? Which suggests that families of centromeric repeats might be shared between closely related species. And these satellites might independently expand or contract in different lineages, and different satellites can be associated with specific types of rearrangement. So in uh, species of uh, deer mice in the genus Paramiscus, uh, there's one single satellite sequence called PMSAT, um, and it's conserved like across all of these species, but its position and repeat like, uh, copy number uh, is associated with given paracentric inversions. Uh, shown on the green chromosomes, Ooh, uh, yeah, there we go. And in contrast, in like wallabies and kangaroos, you have a lot more uh, changes in chromosome uh, like structure, uh, usually involving the centromere. 
uh, and there are like three satellite families found uh, across this group and their presence or absence, and again, copy number is associated with very specific rearrangements. So these sort of you know, collectively paint the centromere as like a key factor underpinning the mechanisms of large-scale structural variation between chromosomes, right? And as someone who's interested in studying this, uh, I've been working with microtosvolts, who are sort of an ideal system for this. They're a pretty species and ecologically diverse group of holarctic rodents, 65 of them in the last like two million years or so. Uh, not a great phylogeny for them. Uh, you know, they are sort of hard to tell apart. They're all uh, in the sort of brown sausage morph. Uh, <laughs> but they have a lot of variation in their dentition and most importantly, uh, their carrier types, right? So to get a sense of that carrier type diversity, here's a cladogram of eight uh, microtosvols and their two ends. Um, and most of these are North American species with the exception of Arvalis. And we're in the process of developing uh, long read genomes for seven of these. And I want to thank the California Conservation Genomics Project for having assembled the eighth in M. Californicus. Um, currently, we have six assemblies, the ones with these red boxes here, some of which are chromosome level, others of which are at large scaffolds. Uh, and among other things, what we'd like to do is use these to investigate centromere diversity, both wi uh, within and between species and chromosomes within the species, right? So if you look at these diploid numbers, right, you'll get the sense that there's a lot of variation sort of between and within these different microtosvols. But what's important to like, bear in mind what I want to stress is that the way they vary is different between these species too. So in longer quarters, that number varies on account of like uh, presence or absence of B chromosomes. Uh, in Californicus, there are Robertsonian fusions in a few parts of their range. Uh, in Arvalis, it's similar to uh, Paramiscus, where there are paracentric inversions, but 2N is conserved uh, wherever they're found. Uh, and you might have noticed, like, up the top here, the creeping vol, M. origone, uh, is particularly distinct from, uh, from its relatives, having had an extremely reduced carrier type, which has led to, among other things, some, some like, very remarkable carrier type features, which I will flag two of for you. Uh, one, that chromosome is bloody massive. Um, it is 20% of the whole genome uh, compared to Okragaster. These two genomes are the same size, but Okragaster has a much more normal distribution of chromosome sizes. Um, so again, this rapid change in chromosome number has led to presumably rapid fusion to fuse like one mega chromosome. Uh, but the most striking thing is definitely their unique sex chromosome system, unique among mammals, um, where females are XO and males are XX where there are two forms of the X chromosome, a maternal XM and paternal XP. They have the same genic content, but uh, the XM has these large heterochromatin tracts, and this, uh, this weird setup was uh, caused by the fusion of the ancestral Y to the X chromosome. So like, another way to think about this is that chromal rearrangements in the species have like, gone so far that they have changed the distribution of sex chromosomes between males and females. So, given this like diversity of carrier types within microtus, right? Um, we you know, they make an ideal system to look at how their carrier types have diversified, and how centromeres have shaped that diversity. Um, so, centromere sequence variation might indicate some of the order and mechanisms of rearrangements within each of these species, uh, especially fusions. And we've got some longer-term goals to look if particular centromeric satellites are associated with given rearrangements. Um, and like I mentioned before, looking at centromeres across species uh, and chromosomes within those species and long down the line chromosome morphology too. So what sequences are involved? Are they conserved or divergent within these species and chromosomes? And I'll show some of the early outcomes of this project. So I mentioned finding centromere repeats is hard and that has definitely proven the case. Uh, but so what we did was we combined like de novo repeat identification methods like uh, came accounting methods like trash as well as using existing repeat models uh, to try and get a sense for across these six genomes where do we find satellite repeats. And we have some like hallmarks to, that we want to look for for whether a satellite is likely the centromere. So it should be the most abundant sequence, should be about as many blocks of it as there are chromosomes, give or take. Uh, and based on you know, like work by, uh, in a few species, but most recently in Paramiscus by Gazafti et al., that the, centromeric, uh, the centromeric satellite should have like a hypomethylated core, 
So these are all things we can look for to be like, this, this is probably the one. This looks like the centromere. So if we look at this whole scaffold is the, the entirety of the chromosome one in the creeping vole. Right in the middle where we expected the centromere to be, we did find this big 161 base pair uh, monomer. Uh, this, it shows up elsewhere in the Oregon vol genome and in other vol microbial genomes we looked at, but also critically at this like fusion point between the X and Y, um, the ancestral X and Y on XP, so the outer ring. You can see there's these like X genes here followed by the pseudo-watersomal region, which then connects to that central ring, these Y-link genes, and then this big core of repeats. Um, including MSAT16, uh, well, sorry, including this red one, spoilers. Um, turns out this is a known one, uh, a known repeat called MSAT160. Uh, it's present in a lot of vol species, but not all of them. There's been some, yeah, some previous work done on it, uh, characterizing it cytogenetically. So this will be a sort of test case while we investigate some of the other candidate centromere repeats that we have. So our starting place, we want to get a sense for diversity of MSAT160. Um, so what we did was for all of our genomes, every scaffold in it, uh, look for uh, MSAT160 by giving trash a template to use uh, and looking for blocks with over 100 copies, which we would call like the primary block. Any other blocks were sort of secondary. And we also found a sort of like subdivided these into split primaries and secondaries where interstitial, telom interstitial telomeres would be inserted. Uh, we took the most common repeat from each of these blocks, uh, used the clustering algorithm to get rid of some erroneously classified ones, uh, aligned them together, and created this neighbor joining tree. So a few cool things to take out of this. All the Arvala sequences grouped together, all but one of the Olgrigoni sequences grouped together. One singular longer cordis repeat, like one single MSAT 160 found across longer cordis. No Pennsylvanicus, which we expected from previous work. And Ochragaster and Californicus are not so well differentiated from one another. What's cool is that this, there's this huge block of almost identical, sometimes but for a base or two, of primary MSAT 160 in Ochragaster, and a second group that is almost entirely secondary, suggesting there's some difference between the primary and secondary uh, repeats within them. We can also look at gene synteny between these five, so no paramiscus here, and in the middle is the creeping vol chromosome one, because showing the whole genome is a big mess. Uh, these sort of like spaghetti, colored spaghetti strands indicate blocks of synteny between the genomes. A uh, lot of synteny, you can see a lot of inversions between them as well. Uh, we can plot the position of MSAT160 atop them. And what I want to flag is that not only is MSAT160 associated with putative fusion and breakpoints across all of these genomes except Longicordus, uh, but the structure of it varies between these different species as well. So in our Valis, we tended to see much larger blocks of primary 160. Uh, in Ochragaster, we saw a lot more of these blocks that have interstitial telomeres in them. Um, yeah. And, oh yeah. And finally, uh, we've started looking at methylation patterns on it as well. We see a hypermethylated core right in the middle. This isn't true of all blocks of MSAT 160. We're still generating this uh, about a few days before I gave this talk. Um, but yeah, so some good evidence that it is a centromeric sequence. Just to summarize, identified a bunch of candidate centromeric sequences. I've talked about one of them, MSAT 160, today. Uh, it's present at fusion points in multiple microtus species. And the way it, its sequence and organization differs between those species, which might give clues as to the potential for some conserved centromeric satellites to uh, drive chromosome variation in these microtus bowls. Um, with that, I would like to thank my lab mates, uh, California Conservation Genomics Project, the US Forest Service, NSF for the money. Um, and if you want to hear more about rodents and karyotypes, I would flag my PhD advisors talk on some work we did together during my PhD, Jeremy Sell, uh, post a session on Monday. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Eloise Muller. I am currently a postdoctorate associate at the University of Albany in the US. But today I would like to present you some work from my PhD that I did at the University of Paris-Saclay in France. So in my PhD, I was interested in household transfer, or HE. HE is the transmission of genetic material independent of uh, reproduction. In prokaryotes, the mechanisms are not very precisely. And we know that it has a major impact on their evolution. In eukaryotes, however, it was thought for many years that horizontal transfer was not even possible because of additional barriers. But since then, it was estimated that about 1% of protein genes come from horizontal transfer. 
And regarding multicellular uh, organisms, we here again have many examples nowadays. Even though most of the transfer are from bacteria or from viruses to multicellular organisms. But during my PhD, I was more precisely interested in how to transfer between animals, so from an animal to another animal. And here there are only four examples of hostile gene transfer. So such event seems very rare. However, if we look at hostile transfer of transposable elements, we now have thousands of examples. The most famous one being the one of the P element that was transferred between two species of Drosophila. So the main reason we now have so many examples of HCG between uh, animals is because we are now able to perform large scale studies. So those are the two main ones I wanted to quickly tell you about. So in the first study, the authors estimated that there was at least 2,000 HTT events between the 200 insects of their data set. And in the second study, the authors estimated that there was at least 975 HTT events between um, the, vert the 200 vertebrates of their data set. So here you can see that HTT between animals is really not as rare as previously thought. So how come transportable elements transfer that much compared to genes, for example? Well, the first reason is simply that it is a massive source of raw genetic material. So just by chance, there is quite a high probability that what is transferred is a transposable element. The second reason is that transposable elements are mobile in a genome, so they have mechanisms to insert at different locations of a host genome. So they could use the same mechanisms to insert in a new host genome. And the third reason is that transposable elements can increase uh, in copy number when they arrive in your new host genome. And because of that, it can, make, it can be difficult for the host genome to get rid of the transposable elements. So even though we now have many examples of uh, transfer of transposable elements between animals, we still don't know what are the mechanisms and other factors that promote those transfers. So there are so, I just show a list of examples of genetic and ecological factors that were suge suggested to play a role in uh, this process, but none of them were ever uh, properly tested. This is because it's very challenging. Uh, the first problem is ho that hostile transfer is a very particular trait. If you take one genome, the value you calculate in this genome can be totally different depending on what are the other genomes in the data set, because it is a shared trait between uh, genomes. And in addition to being methodologically very challenging, it is also very computationally uh, challenging, even though you have seen that uh, large-scale studies are now possible. But the study are only able to estimate the minimum number of HTT events that took place across the data set. For now, they are not able to properly assign those events to precise branches, which is necessary to uh, study a factor. So during my PhD, um, we have been able to uh, study the factor of the aquatic lifestyle. So why did we choose this factor and not another one from the list? So simply because it was quite promising. Indeed, it is known that hostile gene transfer is rampant in uh, marine bacteria and also in marine unicellular um, eukaryotes. Regarding vertebrates, uh, the study of Zangetol already quickly told you about earlier estimated that about 93% of all the HTT that recovered in their data set of vertebrates involved teleotheos fish. So there we can wonder if it's because of the aquatic lifestyle that those fish have that many transfer. And more recently, Gozashti et al. Uh, scanned more than 3,000 uh, eukaryotic genomes, and they found that aquatic organisms were 6.5 more likely to contact introners. Introners being transposable elements that become intron. There could be a, a link here with uh, hostile transfer. And the last reason, which is quite important, is that we now have more and more genomes available, and we do now have many aquatic and terrestrial uh, genomes of, anim of uh, animals and NCBI. So how did we design our data set to test our hypothesis? So of course, we're including uh, fish uh, genomes, and we can compare how many transfers they have compared to the terrestrial uh, vertebrates. But this is not enough at all. Even if we find way more transfer in the fish, how do we know it's because of the aquatic lifestyle and not because of any other ecological or genetic factors uh, they shared? So to be able to conclude that it is because of the aquatic lifestyle that they have so many transfer, we need to sample several taxa, each of which represent as many independent transitions of lifestyle as possible. So we can easily add six uh, taxa because all those uh, terrestrial vertebrates also underwent uh, secondary transitions uh, to the aquatic lifestyle. But we didn't keep stay just with vertebrates. We also included um, Anelida uh, and uh, Crustacea. And regarding arthropods, we included Chelicerata and uh, Crustacea. And we also included uh, eight taxa of insects, even though here the aquatic insects are aquatic only um, at the larval stage. So here we have a total of uh, 19 taxa, each of which 
underwent at least one independent transition of life cell. And the idea will be to check whether for each taxa, we each time observe more HTT in the aquatic species compared to their terrestrial counterparts. So for this, we of course first need to detect all those HTT in this uh, big data set. So for this, uh, we sampled 247 animal genomes for NCBI that re represent um, aquatic and terrestrial species in the 19 taxa. Then we annotated the transposable elements in all those genomes using repeat modeler and repeat masker. And we kept only copies that were at least 300 base pairs long. So at this step, we were working with a total of 111 million of copies of transposable elements. Then we used those copies to do similarity searches between each pair of uh, species. So 247 times 247 in both directions. We had to do about 60,000 searches. So of course, this is, we, we obtained a incredible big amount of hits, so we have to do we use some filters. And an important point I want to point out is that we kept only hits that show at least 75% of identity. So at this step, we had 247 hits um, of uh, copies of transposable elements. So now, how do we know whether uh, those copies are similar because of our cell transfer, or simply because they were vertically inherited in uh, related genomes? So to assess which of those hits was it of our cell transfer, we calculated the DS, or the synonymous distance, of each of those hits, and we compared it to the distribution of DS, which is expected under vertical uh, inheritance, which is represented here in green. And for each hit, we, calculate, we compare this DS with, uh, the DS of the dis with the one of the distribution, and if it was significantly under the distribution, like it is in this uh, example, we conclude that this hit is the result of horizontal transfer. So doing this with other hits, we determine that about 17 million of the hits resulted in horizontal transfer. So this is still a huge number. Of course, it doesn't mean we have this, that many events, simply because transposable elements are in many copies, so a single HTT event can lead to thousands of hits. So then we had many steps of clustering to do. And it is actually at this step that we did the most change compared to the previous study, and it is thanks to this step that we are able to test uh, factors. So this is uh, what we obtained. So here, each line represents one independent event of horizontal transfer, so you can see that they are a bit everywhere. Um, the blue lines represent transfer of class one transposable elements, so the RNA, and the red lines represent the transfer of the class two elements, so the DNA elements. So overall, we estimated that there was at least 60,000 HTT events across these, uh, these data sets of animals. And more precisely, we found that one-fourth of all the pair of spaces we investigated had at least one uh, horizontal transfer between each other. And only 28 spaces were not involved in a single HTT. But what about our initial question? What is the effect of the aquatic lifestyle on this pattern we observed? So to re remove several bias, we chose to work with sampling. So at each sampling, we sample only one aquatic and one terrestrial species in each taxa. And we calculated the difference in HTT uh, between the aquatic species and the terrestrial uh, species, so that this, this, uh, the x-axis. We then calculated the average uh, on the 19 taxa. And repeating this uh, 1,000 times, we calculated the average value, which is represented by this uh, red line. So here you can see that it is a negative, which means that on average, across other taxa, uh, we found more uh, HTT in the terrestrial species, the opposite of what we were looking for. So it can seem firstly quite surprising, but if we compare this uh, to the distribution which is expected under our new hypothesis, so no effect of the, of the life cell, we can see that it really falls in the middle almost of the um, distribution. So here, we are clearly not able to conclude that there was any effect of the life cell, nor the aquatic, nor the terrestrial, on the number of uh, HTT. So we could have stopped there, but we wanted to go a little uh, further. Uh, and to see whether we could uh, test um, what, if there is an effect of the phylogenetic proximity, a bit more cleaner than what has been done previously. So for this, we could simply plot the number of HTT as a function of the time of the divergence. But the problem with that is that it doesn't take into account the phylogenetic inertia and some other problems I don't have time to go through. So instead, we decided to go with the um, Bayesian approach. So here we did one modeling for each species individually. So this is an example just for one of the species uh, this, the, the moth which is on the picture now. And uh, the black dot shows how many horizontal transfer we found between uh, these focal uh, spaces on each of the 
other species who has different terms of divergence. And then uh, in pitch, you can see the results of uh, the modeling, so the predicted number of HTT. So here you can see that the predicting values fits quite well uh, with the data. And uh, we always, in, so we did the modeling like 10,000 times, and each time we always find a negative effect of the time of divergence. You can see that the, the red dots is actually a line, uh, is, doesn't overlap zero. So at least for that species, we can conclude that there is a strong negative effect of the time of uh, divergence. So the closer you are from that species, the more chance you have uh, to have horizontal transfer with that species. But that doesn't tell you anything about how much chance you have from, with another species. So for that, we had to repeat the modeling independently for each of the species, and we are able to find a negative um, impact of the phylogenetic proximity uh, with 161 of our species. So those are the species who are indicating by uh, black dots in the phylogeny. And the thing which is important to see here is that the black dots are spread all over the phylogeny. So it doesn't seem to be just the result of phylogenetic inertia. And it seems that um, this, this, um, this effect is true for all uh, the taxa we included. So to conclude, we found a myriad of HTG events in all four phylum of animals we studied. We found that class two transposable elements uh, were more involved than class uh, one. We could not find any effect of the, phylogetic, of the um, aquatic lifestyle on the number of HTG, but we were able to find a strong effect of the phylogetic proximity. And more generally, we propose a method that can be used to test any ecological factor on the number of HTG, even though I didn't have time to go through the methods with you. And to finish, I would like to thank my collaborators and mostly Clément Gilbert, who was my PhD advisor. I would also like to thank all the people taking care of the bioinformatics platforms I use without which, which this study would have been totally impossible. And I would like to thank my current PI, uh, Cheryl Andam. And thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Sorry about that delay uh, there a little bit. Uh, we'll do some rushing through uh, the introduction. So my name is Sarah Miller. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about genomic architecture and social insects. So eusociality is a dramatic shift in social organization characterized mainly by this evolution of reproductive division of labor. So this has been a highly successful thing for insects. So eusocial insects are about 2% of total all uh, species, but about 50% of insect biodiversity. So eusociality is also a parallel speciation story, or a parallel uh, evolution story. So we see multiple independent origins of eusociality across hymenoptera, which are gonna be your ants, your bees, your wasps, including uh, some independent origins or changes within families. We also see uh, origins of eusociality in different insect orders, including uh, social thrips, social beetles, social aphids, and termites. So uh, what I am interested in is how sociality might impact genomic architecture. And uh, there are a couple things inherent to use sociality that we can make predictions that might impact uh, the way insects organize their genomes. So the first is this evolution of reproductive division of labor is predicted to affect uh, effective population size. So moving from having just a few num uh, lots of individuals reproducing to just a few number of individuals reproducing, uh, we think will lower your overall effective population size. Uh, so how does this impact genomic architecture? So we can imagine a model in which as social complexity increases, we see this decrease in effective population size. And we know uh, populations with small, smaller effective population sizes are gonna be more prone to effects of things like genetic drift. And so this might in turn lead to an increased genetic load. So it's been theorized that this could in turn lead to an expansion of the size of our genome as organisms are less able to select against transposable elements. And this seems to uh, play out in social shrimp. However, a lot of social hymenoptera have really teeny tiny genomes, and so it's less clear if this is more of a universal pattern or not. So another way that organisms can uh, control for this increase in genetic load could be by upping their recombination rates. Um, but a side effect of doing this is that it also increases your rate of GC bias gene conversion. So this preferentially adds GCs to your genome, but if you get a lot of CPG sites next to each other, these tend to up your mutation rate to Ts, uh, resulting in actually a decrease in your GC content kind of counterintuitively. 
Okay, so uh, what does recombination rate variation look like across insects and uh, social insects and their relatives? So there are not a huge number of uh, measures of this. Uh, we looked through the literature and found 15 in Hymenoptera, uh, but they match pretty well our expectations. So we see that uh, rec as recombination rates increase, we see this decrease in GC content. We also find that our social species are on the sort of down right side of this. Our uh, non-social species are on the top, kind of reassuringly uh, primitively used social, or one primitively used social species is falling nicely in the middle here. Um, but this is not a great representation of insect diversity. And in fact, a lot of this is being really pulled by uh, four species of apis or honeybee. Um, so making it hard to know how sort of universal this pattern is. So another challenge that social insects have to face with their genome is how do you encode information from multiple casts within a single genome? And when the honeybee genome was first sequenced uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, it was small, it had a high recombination rate, the highest recombination rate at the time that was known for any eukaryote, and it also had a, a really interesting feature of its coding regions. Uh, so in insects, uh, methylation occurs at these CPG sites uh, almost entirely in the coding part of the genome. And then looking at CPG distribution uh, in coding uh, part of the genome for honeybees, uh, researchers found this really nice bimodal pattern, suggesting that maybe a recombination rate kind of worked in concert uh, with this to generate an easy way to turn on or turn off different parts of your genome, generating your different casts. So fabulous, it seems to be like a really great way of solving this problem. What does this look like in other species? Uh, so uh, we have Drosophila, which don't do methylation, which have a nice unimodal distribution. There's our honeybee that I just showed you. Here's another independent origin of sociality that's also bimodal. Here's a non-social wasp that has a unimodal distribution, looking pretty good. And then we come here to an ant, so which is highly social, has a unimodal distribution, uh, so not matching this pattern at all. Uh, so what we wanted to do is zoom out a little bit and then ask across these sort of parallel uh, origins of eusocial behavior, do we also see parallel changes in genomic architecture? And so we made some predictions. So uh, we expected to see higher recombination rates, those higher genome sizes, that lower GC content that I talked about, and more prevalent bimodal CPG distributions. So if you're looking for genomic data, the place to go is NCBI. Uh, and there has been a growth of new uh, genomes out there, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so we found a fantastic group of 435 genomes in Hymenoptera, a less fantastic group of only eight in our termites and cockroaches, and unfortunately no assemblies for other independent origins of sociality. So all of the formal analyses I'm gonna talk about today are gonna to be in Hymenoptera. I'll show you some of the Bladidia data just for kicks. Um, and I feel kind of sad complaining about a lack of genome assemblies when I'm talking about 435 genome assemblies, but it would be great if someone could add a few for our other independent origins too. Uh, we also uh, wanted to look at this in a phylogenetically controlled context. Uh, there was not great overlap between existing hymenopteran phylogenies and the genomes that are assembled, so we made our own. And this is pretty peripheral to the results that I'm gonna talk about, but we are super excited. So if you have a need for a UCE phylogeny across all hymenopteran genomes that have been assembled, assembled, please come talk to me, we're excited about it. Um, so yeah, so we wanted to investigate this and we used three different phylogenetic uh, comparative methods, which both have some sort of pros and cons. Uh, so one of the big difference between these is, so I've been talking about use sociality like it's a binary variable, it is a continuous variable, it is complex. Uh, this is the question that people most ask me about is how I define sociality. And there's, uh, we had to make a lot of simplifying assumptions with this larger data set. So uh, for uh, Philo GLM and uh, PGLMM both require binary data, and in this case we classified everybody from facultatively use social on up as social, and everybody else as non-social. Uh, Philo AOV takes categorical data, so we're able to use these as different categories. Uh, we got the same results with everything, um, so I'm just gonna show you those sort of as is. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, so starting with genome size. So in the top, we can see our distribution across social and non-social species. Uh, so our social species are a teensy bit smaller, but we see a pretty big tail. So this was the opposite of my distribution. We can map what that looks like on the phylogeny. There's our cockroaches, which are kind of confusing, and no one really knows what's going on there, but there are not many of them. 
And if you're looking for a pattern and not really finding one, uh, that's exactly what we found. So we didn't find any relationship between these after we corrected for phylogenetic history. We did the same thing with GC content. So now we're matching our predictions. We're seeing a slightly lower GC content in our social species than our non-social species. Uh, we see the reverse pattern in our cockroaches and termites. Um, again, if we map it on the phylogeny, uh, nothing really jumped out at you. And that's again uh, because there's no relationship between these after we correct for phylogenetic history. Okay, so uh, we then moved on and we wanted to look at CPG distribution. And so this is a bit of a complicated graph. So uh, those that are in shaded are gonna be our social species. Those that are in white are gonna be our non-social species. Uh, those with dotted lines uh, are best defined by a bimodal distribution. Uh, those with sort of solid lines are best defined by a unimodal distribution. Um, there's our honeybee right there. Uh, so we do see, especially, oh, um, our cockroaches, they're a little cut off on the screen. Cockroaches and termites are on our far left corner uh, if you're interested in looking at those as well. Okay, so uh, we do see some uh, patterns that are consistent with it. So in Apis, uh, we see some bimodal distributions in social species, uh, but we also see some notable exceptions as well. So uh, all of our ants show a unimodal distribution. Uh, there's kind of a hodgepodge and other things. And then again, up in that sort of far right corner, we also see a bimodal distribution in a non-social species. Um, so quite a bit of variation uh, that's going on here. Uh, so again, uh, we corrected for a uh, phylogenetic relationship and uh, just to do some under the cover things, we couldn't do this as bimodal versus non-bimodal. Uh, we looked at both the range of that distribution with expecting that bimodal distributions are gonna be bigger than unimodal distributions. We also looked at the mean of those distributions. In both cases, uh, again, we didn't really find a relationship. Okay, so nothing uh, is really coming, no sort of universal pattern across of these, uh, but I talked about how we also see variation in sociality within some families. So we had two groups that we had a fair amount of data for that also show variation in their social behavior uh, within those groups. So this apidae, uh, which is kind of honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and so on, and helictidae, which are our sweat bees. Uh, so we had 75 uh, apidae genomes and 25 helictidae genomes. And what does this look like across all of them? So we ran exactly the same thing, but just looking at these uh, within family comparisons. So in apidae, we don't see any interaction between genome size, but we do see a significant association with GC content and our social species uh, with matching our predictions. In helictids, uh, we don't see that in, uh, with GC content, but we do see it with genome size, but in the reverse direction. So social species and helictids have smaller genomes um, than non-social species. Um, and uh, we were able to look at this, uh, we had a smaller uh, data set for annotations, it's making this tough to tell. Uh, we didn't see a relationship for this in apidae, but could be a data limitation and didn't really have enough to look at this in helictidae. Okay, so returning to my predictions. Uh, so we do see that association with elevated recombination rates in social species, uh, but would love to get a bunch more data to really uh, feel confident in this result. But we don't see any evidence of parallel evolution, genome size, GC content, or CPG distribution. Um, and so just to kind of sum this up, I guess uh, when I initially got these results, I was a little bummed. I was looking for like a universal pattern of sociality, uh, but kind of giving it a bit more thought, I think this is actually a more interesting result because it suggests to me that these groups have uh, parallelly solved these challenges in different ways. Um, so how they deal with uh, effective population sizes and maintaining um, their genome for different casts. One thing that we would love to do in the future is this is a pretty coarse measure of social variation um, and effective population size, so we'd love to dig into this a little bit more in detail. And uh, we would love to get some more genome for independent origins of social behavior. 
Okay, Whew. with that, I want to thank uh, my lab. We did this as a lab project, and especially my students, Garrett and Samir, uh, were brave enough to be talked into this the first semester of their PhD program, so uh, much kudos to them, and my postdoc, Tom Hagen, as well. Uh, you can check out what we're interested in on my website there, and thank you all. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashmika Barry. I'm a PhD candidate at Marquette University in Tony Gamble's lab, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about my work looking at sex chromosomes in a legless gecko, Lyallus bertonis. So sex chromosomes are some of the most rapidly evolving parts of the genome, at least in most animals. And fusions are one of the predominant ways in which they change, particularly fusions with autosomes. And these fusions can have substantial consequences on a species um, evolution. But despite that, we really know very little about the evolutionary drivers behind these fusions. But how does a sex chromosome actually fuse with an autosome? So at least in an XY system, you have an autosome fused to the Y, creating this Neo-Y region. The homologous chromosome is still recombining with this Neo-Y, which leads to a Neo-X chromosome. So you now have the ancestral X and the Neo X both recombining with this large Y, creating this XXY system. Now, these fusions of Y chromosomes with an autosome are actually the most frequent type of autosome sex chromosome fusions that we see, at least in squamates. So this phylogeny is illustrating just that. Um, it's showing a phylogeny of all squamates, which are lizards and snakes. And they're color-coded by their sex-determining system, so either XY or ZW. And these brown, which maybe you can see, maybe not. Oh, there we go. So these brown boxes are indicating um, fusions of a Y with an autosome. As you can see on this phylogeny, the Y autosome fusions are the most frequent. But again, despite this frequency, we don't know any of the, or a lot of the evolutionary drivers behind it. So we wanted to look at the evolution of sex chromosomes for one of these systems, which is Lyallis. Lyallis are part of this family of legless geckos, um, and they all have XY chromosomes. But species in the genus Lyallis actually have this XXY system. And today I'm going to be focusing on Lyallis bertonis. It's found in Australia and New Guinea. And they're a really good system for this because Lyallis bertonis, um, we actually know a lot of information about their sex chromosomes. So we've known that they have this XXY system since 1970. And in 2016, our collaborat collaborators redid the karyotype, so we were able to identify the correct sex chromosomes. So the sex chromosomes for Lyallis bertonis are the largest in the karyotype, with the Neo-X being this more medium-sized chromosome. In addition, there's a lot of other information that we've learned. So we also know that the Y is full of a lot of heterochromatin and telomeric repeats. We know that the ancestral X is shared among all pygopodids and that it's syntinic with chicken chromosome 4Q. And we actually see no evidence of dosage compensation in the sex chromosomes, at least the ancestral sex chromosomes. So despite all this information, there are still a lot of outstanding questions that we have about the system. So the one I'm going to focus on today is looking at which autosome actually fused with the Y. So to do this, we first needed a reference assembly. So we used PacBio HiFi reads and assembled that with HiFi ASM. I then used Hi-C um, to scaffold our assembly using Juicer and 3D DNA to get a preliminarily phased assembly. So our assembly is 2.91 gigs in size with 138 scaffolds and a scaffold N50 of nearly 200 megabases. So it's a very high quality assembly. And on the left, um, I'm showing the Hi-C contact map where each of these red, darker red squares correlates to one of our 17 uh, chromosome level scaffolds. But what you might notice is in the top left corner, we have a little bit of a mess going on in our map. So if we zoom in, it looks like there are two to three different chromosomes smushed into this one scaffold. So we thought that this was likely due to the fusion of an autosome with our sex chromosomes. So our goal was to parse this out and separate out each sex chromosome. And this is actually a larger problem that we have in genome assemblies. So historically, Diploid genomes have been used that are really inbred, which are then um, collapsed into a single haplotype reference. But if you have a very outbred genome with a lot of heterozygosity, or if you have an X and a Y chromosome, for example, that um, collapsed reference assembly becomes very mosaic and not very biologically accurate. So instead, our goal is to phase our assembly where we have entire scaffolds of either the maternal or paternal allele, which is more biologically accurate. 
Now this is hard enough to do in autosomes, let alone with sex chromosomes, let alone with sex chromosomes with a fusion. So unfortunately, the high C contact map was not enough information for us to parse this out. So we used multiple different methods in order to phase our sex chromosomes. So I'll walk through each one individually. First, we used microdissected chromosomes. So our collaborators, when um, redoing the karyotype, were actually able to scrape off each sex chromosome and amplify and sequence each sex chromosome independently. So we can then map that onto our reference assembly. So here I'm showing a circles plot of our reference assembly where each box corresponds to one of our 17 chromosome level scaffolds. And when we map our X and our Y chromosomes, we see that they both map to that first scaffold. So this was just a great sanity check that, yep, that mess that we were seeing at scaffold one is a chimeric scaffold of our sex chromosomes. So we can zoom in on scaffold one, and we can immediately start to see um, parts of our sex chromosomes. So we can see these regions that are potentially just Y. We can see what looks like the ancestral X, and areas where both the X and Y chromosomes map, which is likely our ancestral pseudo-autosomal region. And then we also see this kind of strange area where neither sex chromosomes map. So from this data, we can pretty confidently say that we've identified the ancestral X and this ancestral pseudo-autosomal region, but there are still many remaining parts. So to, to start to fill in these gaps, we then also did resequencing of multiple males and females and looked at read depth. So for read depth, we assume that males and females will have very similar read depth in the autosomes, but females will have higher read depth in the X chromosome and lower read depth compared to the males in the Y chromosome. And then the pseudo-autosomal region should look the same between males and females. So we did that um, for our scaffold one. And what we see is male reads are about one all the way across our scaffold one. This makes sense since we um, our reference is from a male. But when we add our female read depth, we can start to parse out some of those um, weirder regions. So about the first 100 megabase or so looks like the Neo-Y, where both the males and females have similar read depth. Then we see a potential Neo-X, where it looks like the female read depth is slightly elevated compared to males. And then we see a complete drop in female read depth, which is likely our ancestral Y. So combining this with our microdissected data, we can then parse out that we have our Neo Y, our Neo X, ancestral Y, ancestral pseudo-autosomal region, and our ancestral X. But what you might notice is that we're still missing the Neo pseudo-autosomal region. So we can't identify that from just this data set, but we're assuming that it's somewhere in the Neo Y in those first 100 or so megabases. So to do that, we looked at FST and pi on our scaffold. So FST is um, looking at the variation between males and females. So we expect the Y to have elevated FST, whereas the pseudo-autosomal region should have lower FST that matches that of the X or autosomes. And pi, which is looking at nucleotide diversity, should also be elevated in males on the Y, but match the females in the pseudo-autosomal region. So that's the pattern that we're looking for to identify the neo-pseudo-autosomal region. So when we look at FST across the entire scaffold, we immediately see some regions that pop up. But again, we're expecting our neo pseudo-autosomal region to just be in that first 100 megabase pairs or so. So in that 100 megabase pairs, you can see some regions that have uh, that first part that has a lower FST and the second part that has a higher FST. And that matches exactly with our pi, where we see the second half um, having higher male pi. And we combine this with the read depth, it becomes pretty clear that the first 75 megabase pairs or so is our neo pseudo-autosomal region, followed by our neo Y. And then all of the other regions that we had previously identified also match up with their expectations. Interestingly, in doing this, we were able to identify a small snippet right after about 325 megabases that was also part of the Y chromosome that we had previously missed. So then we can combine this with all of our prior data. If it'll load. There we go. And um, we can say that we have confidently identified all the major regions of our sex chromosomes in the scaffold, including the neo pseudo-autosomal region. So with this data, we can go back to our high seat contact map and manually curate it. So now we have our neo X, our Y chromosome, and our ancestral X chromosome all on their own scaffold. And with this phased 
high quality assembly, we can finally start to answer questions about how these sex chromosomes evolved. So like I mentioned earlier, the question I'm gonna focus on today is which autosome actually fused with the ancestral Y. So to answer this question, I looked at protein coding uh, genes found in chickens, and then I blasted those to our Lyalis reference assembly and sorted them by the hits that match to our Lyalis sex chromosomes. So on this table, I'm showing all the chicken chromosomes and the number of hits they had to our Lyalis sex chromosomes. And the two with the highest hits were chicken chromosome two and chicken chromosome four. Now chicken chromosome four makes total sense. We already know that the ancestral X is syntonic to chicken chromosome 4Q. So this tells us that chicken chromosome two is syntonic with the autosome that fused in Lyalis. We then wanted to look at a more closely related species. So we looked at leopard gecko, or Eublepharus macularius. Um, we already have a high quality reference genome for this species, which are a lot also assembled. So we looked at annotated genes that were homologous between Eublepharus and Lyalis. So what I'm about to show is a dot plot. So on the x-axis are the Eublepharus chromosomes, and on the y, we can see the Lyalis sex chromosomes. So it looks like Lyalis neo-X is homologous with Eublepharus chromosome seven and Lyalis X chromosome is, is homologous with Eublepharus 10 and 11. Then we can do the same thing for the Lyalis Y, and similarly, it's homologous with Eublepharus chromosome 7 and 11. We can then also look at syntony, which, that's very strange. Um, well, just trust me when I tell you that there is syntony between the Lyalis Y, X, and Eublepharus 10 and 11. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, in summary, we've uh, assembled a high quality phased reference assembly for Lyalis Bertonis. Um, and we can use this to answer other questions about the biology of Lyalis, um, for example, looking at their limb loss. Um, we were able to answer this question of which autosome fused to the Y. We know that it's syntonic with chicken chromosome two and Eublepharus chromosome seven. And we were able to identify that Eublepharus chromosomes 10 and 11 are syntonic with the ancestral sex chromosomes of Lyalis. So this is all just a first step to learning a lot more about the evolutionary factors that can lead to these fusions that we repeatedly see across squamates. So with that, I'd love to thank my lab and funding sources. And if you're interested in learning more about squamate genomics, we are part of this big consortium that just got started this year. So feel free to take a picture or scan the QR code if you want information on how to join. So thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. I think it was just a misassembly with the basically the Neo X getting inserted into the middle because of the, um, because of the high contact between the Neo X and the Y. And so when I manually curated it, it just immediately got next back like in, um, back into the rest of the Y.